Soviet challenge to the free world concerns us all, yet few of us will have a chance to take a first-hand look at the sources of Soviet power. Travel to the Soviet Union is difficult and expensive. Foreigners cannot photograph, or in many cases, even see what they want. Official Soviet films and news broadcasts give a one-sided view of Soviet reality. How then can we find out what is meant when some people speak of the Soviet military and industrial threat to our way of life? How has this threat come upon us so suddenly? After all, 50 years ago, the Russian peasant was a symbol of a basically agricultural society. Yet today, the Russian factory worker has been described as the new symbol of a highly industrialized and aggressive world power. How has this startling transformation come about? Part of my life's work is to study this question. My name is Alfred Reber, and I teach Russian history at Northwestern University. My wife and I have lived and studied in Moscow and traveled widely throughout Soviet Russia. With my own eyes, I have seen this once slumbering giant awake and to help you see it too, I have selected and arranged some official Soviet films which dramatize the modernization of old Russia. My own comments are aimed at putting these propaganda films in their proper perspective. Keep in mind the enormous size of the Soviet Union, one-sixth of the world's land surface in a single massive block. Based here, communist power has spread beyond these frontiers to the Soviet bloc and to the local communist parties who operate also under Moscow's orders in many countries of the world. I have no time in this film to analyze the political doctrines of communism. I must assume that you understand at least its basic principles. If you don't, you should try to study and understand them. What I do want to show you is how tough revolutionary leaders wielded this doctrine like a club, first to seize power and then to transform the entire economic life of the country in my own short lifetime. In the last century, under the Russian Empire, this vast area was just beginning to build a modern economy and experiment with representative government. World War I abruptly interrupted this process. Russia was defeated. Revolution followed defeat, and in 1917, the Tsarist monarchy collapsed. After the Russians made a brief try at democracy, the Bolsheviks seized power. Soviet propaganda now claims the Bolshevik revolution was a spontaneous mass national uprising. The official story relates how war-weary soldiers and sailors revolted against the provisional government and how the nation enthusiastically joined them to bring to power a small group of revolutionaries led by Lenin and Trotsky. But this is legend and not truth. Out of this legend emerged the cult of Lenin, which serves as an inspiration to world communists. Actually, the mass of the Russian people did not accept the dictatorship of Lenin and his Bolsheviks. A bloody civil war raged for three years, but the Bolsheviks were well-organized and ruthless. Backed by armed, discontented factory workers and landless, desperate peasants, they won the war. The country was devastated. Hunger and misery were widespread. But the political revolution was now over. Russia had become a Soviet state, Lenin its first dictator. How did the Bolsheviks intend to reconstruct their war-torn country? Lenin died before this question could be answered. The party leaders here assembled at his funeral already had begun to fight among themselves for party leadership. Trotsky and other intellectuals insisted that the Soviet state could industrialize and socialize only after a successful world communist revolution. But the Russian masses were tired of fighting. The party secretary, Joseph Stalin, offered them a more attractive solution. Turn Russia into a modern industrialized socialist state and make this the basis from which to spread the world revolution. 
Because he controlled the party apparatus, as well as the secret police, Stalin crushed the opposition. Then he launched the second phase of the revolution. It had two main objectives, rapid development of heavy industry and collectivization of the nation's peasants and farmland. It was an amazing revolution. Here was a government trying to plan and carry out the complete transformation of the economy in five short years. Private property was confiscated, and peasants were herded into collective farms. Threats and promises whipped the industrial workers into a frenzy of activity. No effort was spared by the state. The nation was transformed into a working camp. Hundreds of thousands of people who did not obey state orders were deported or executed. Women were pulled out of their homes and put to work in industry. Only those who worked would get bread, and not much of that either. Industrialization demanded new skills. Stalin launched a determined campaign to wipe out illiteracy. Peasants struggled painfully to learn to read and write. Few potential sources of labor or brain power were left untapped. There were some spectacular results, and the party made much of them. The enormous Dnipestroy Dam harnessed the power of the Dnieper Rapids. The newly built Turksib Railroad hauled great grain loads thousands of miles into the new growing industrial areas of Central Asia. But there were even more failures, and these were not often publicly reported. The people in the countryside were in revolt, and voices of protest rose within the party itself against the frightful cost of the five-year plan. But to Stalin, any opposition to his grandiose design was the equivalent of treason. By 1936, he ordered a bloody purge which decimated the ranks of the party leadership. Many of Lenin's close supporters were arrested, tortured, and executed. Fear shrouded the country, but the relentless drive to carry out the economic plan did not slacken. Suddenly, in 1941, the Nazi attack stunned the Soviet leaders. At first unprepared, Stalin quickly appealed to the Russians to defend their homeland as well as to defend communism. The newly built factories poured out mountains of war supplies. A massive Soviet counterattack, heavily supported by Allied supplies and military action on other fronts, pushed the Nazis back across Eastern Europe and into the heart of Germany. Now, as the Allies defeated Hitler and Japan, the Soviet Union claimed the right to be called a world power. The wartime alliance broke up on the question of rebuilding a new Europe on the ruins of the old. Stalin rejected American offers of economic aid to help the Soviet Union rebuild its devastated industry. Behind a curtain of fear, the Soviet leaders forced a war-weary population to take up the burden of reconstruction alone. The task was almost completed when Stalin died. Again, the world wondered, who of Stalin's lieutenants would seize the reins of power? Malyakov, Beria, Molotov, Khrushchev? Then as before, the man who controlled the party organization took personal power. Nikita Khrushchev, heir to Stalin as party secretary, eliminated his rivals and emerged as undisputed leader in 1956, before the hand-picked 20th Party Congress, Khrushchev launched a double campaign, one to downgrade Stalin and his methods, another to overtake the United States and its Western allies as the leading industrial power in the world. By attacking Stalin, Khrushchev aimed at lifting the burden of fear and terror which had paralyzed individual initiative in industry and agriculture. Now, for the first time, farm leaders and factory managers were urged to contribute new ideas and methods, still, of course, under the guidance of the party. By overtaking the Western economies, Khrushchev aimed at proving to the world that the Soviet system was superior to democracy, and that communism was the answer to the unending search for adequate food, clothing, and shelter for all men, from the Soviet Congress to the people.
Through the press and party workers, the word was spread. The dreaded secret police of the Stalin age lost much of its power, and the propaganda machine took over the bulk of persuasion. Planners and engineers set to work preparing elaborate blueprints for a new seven-year plan. Vast untapped resources were exploited at Khrushchev's orders. Virgin forests of the north and east were cut to provide building materials and make room for new settlements. The frozen soil of Siberia was scraped away and open pit mines appeared in areas that were considered uninhabitable only a short time before. Huge hydroelectric works were erected along the rivers in the newly developed areas. Electric wires were strung out into the vast eastern territories. Had not Lenin said that communism was the Bolshevik power plus electrification of the country? The heavy industrial base begun under Stalin was broadened. The great sacrifices and sufferings of the 1930s were beginning to pay off in production figures. Under new leadership, Soviet industry spurted forward. Nowhere are the achievements of the Soviet Union more impressive than in the field of heavy industry. Though these are official films, they give a good idea of the variety and complexity of Soviet industrial power. Steel is the heart of this power. Steel for rails, for machine tools, for tanks, for guns, and for tractors. Recently, the capacity of Soviet steel production increased sharply and now threatens to equal that of the United States. Output in other basic products, such as minerals, cement, and fuels, continues to mount steadily. The structure of the Soviet economic system encourages the introduction of the most advanced industrial techniques, especially automation. Soviet drive to overtake the West in industrial production is serious and determined. Moscow is confident of success. Spectacular Soviet achievements at this level will offer a strong attraction to the underdeveloped countries to follow the pattern of a totalitarian system. Let's pause for a moment and think. Had there not been a ruthless communist regime in Russia, would industrialization have occurred anyway? Of course it would. And probably even more successfully had there been a free exchange of ideas, flow of investments from abroad, and competition. But let's return to reality. What does all this development mean for the Soviet man in the street? Here is one scene familiar to us. A press stamping out the frame of an automobile. The finished product is a compact Russian car. If you watch carefully, you will see that the people on the sidewalk are just as surprised as I was to see this car on the streets of Moscow. Few of these people can hope to own a car during their lifetime. This scene dramatizes the fact that Soviet planners are still reluctant to provide consumer goods at the expense of heavy industry. Nevertheless, the regime has had to do something to satisfy the craving of the Russian people for housing. Khrushchev said recently that the construction cranes are becoming the symbol of the new Soviet cities. Perhaps this is true. But unlike the modern steel mills, you can see here how primitive handicraft methods are used side by side with cranes. You can see how cheaply most of these prefabricated houses are made. Yet they are considered luxurious by Muscovites who have been sharing an apartment or even one room with other families. More and better housing provides a strong incentive for the people to work even harder for the future. Someday, soon, one of these apartments might be theirs. 
synthetic fibers, nylon. The textile industry has been thrown into high gear, in part at least, to produce more consumer goods. More and better quality clothing is being turned out of Soviet factories. True, these materials are still inferior to Western products, but compared to what the Russian people were accustomed, they are a vast improvement. Naturally, you can notice the difference between the clothes displayed in shop windows and the clothes worn by the people. For some time at least, high prices of well-made dresses and coats will prevent the masses from enjoying them. But standardization of clothing styles and manufacture of synthetic fibers have already overcome the worst shortages. Carefully staged scenes such as this one give the false impression that all the Russian people share a life of abundance and leisure. This is Gum, the largest Russian department store. When my wife and I shopped in this store and others over a period of a year, we encountered crowds of people, long lines, and very few choices of products. The better quality products are likely to be Czech, German, or Hungarian. Shopping for food is a serious problem in the Soviet Union. Fresh fruit like this is very scarce at any time of year. In January, it is often difficult to find such simple staples as potatoes and onions. It is obvious that while industry has forged ahead, agriculture has not kept pace. While in the United States, 8% of the population produces enough food for the rest of the nation, 40% of the Soviet population cannot feed Soviet Russia adequately. Clearly, Soviet agriculture is and will remain for some time the weakest link in the Soviet economy. Here, a huge mountain of grain harvested in the Ukraine is dumped on the ground where it rots away because there is no place to store it. Serious problems in distribution give rise to local shortages in one city when there is plenty to eat elsewhere. Khrushchev's scheme to solve the problem was to open up the untilled grasslands of Central Asia to farm production. Men like these were sent with orders from Moscow to build collective or state farms in the virgin prairie. Along with the ever-present party organizers, machinery was supplied. Brand new villages sprang up to house the transplanted populations with hospitals for the sick, with nurseries for the children, and even lectures and night classes for the adults. But Khrushchev's virgin land policies have not been a success. Khrushchev was forced to admit recently that wheat production has fallen far short of the goals of the seven-year plan. The livestock problem is even more acute. Cattle and sheep raising never recovered from the days when peasants who were forced into collectives defied the government by slaughtering thousands of head. According to Soviet statistics, the number of sheep in the country only recently reached the level of 1928, that is, before collectivization. Here is a model Soviet dairy collective. Notice that women do much of the work. This is one of the best farms in the dairy industry, but to any child from Wisconsin, it is obvious that this farm is far behind comparable American dairies. Khrushchev will have to do far better to fulfill his boast of catching up with the United States in dairy and egg production. Mechanization is spreading in agriculture and modern methods are applied. The new seven-year plan sets high priorities for agricultural machinery. But the contrast between the helicopter and the horse-drawn carriage dramatizes the wide gap that still exists in agriculture between Soviet plans and reality. To carry out the ambitious programs in agriculture and industry, the Communist Party must train large numbers of technicians and scientific workers. Increased concern for a modern school system reflects the growing demands of a new kind of society on the Soviet state. This is a model Soviet elementary school. Someday, the Soviet leaders want every school to be like this one. 
Here, the young children are taught unquestioned loyalty to the state and party, as well as very demanding academic subjects. To one who has lived in the Soviet Union, the children in these scenes look more like professional models than the average Soviet child. But this school and these children serve as an inspiration to the Soviet citizen. By supporting the regime, he can hope to see his children or his grandchildren raised in similar circumstances. These films of the Soviet secondary school are more true to life. The Soviet government is working hard to solve the problems of overcrowding, double and even triple shifts, inadequate facilities, and low salaries for secondary teachers. From among these students are selected the most ambitious and intelligent to continue their work in the university. Students with particular abilities and talents are guided into specialized work. Political training continues in the university. However, mass lectures on ideology like one are greeted with private skepticism by many students. Attendance, however, is compulsory. From my own experience, I am convinced that the top-notch minds are attracted to the physical sciences and mathematics. Their practical and theoretical skills are so highly valued by the state that no expense is spared in providing them with excellent technical facilities. By cutting down on manpower trained to produce consumer goods, the state uses its best educated people for creative scientific work. Young people who display manual rather than intellectual skills are put into the trade schools where they are trained at an advanced level to form the ranks of skilled craftsmen. The Soviet government is now fighting hard to prevent any split in society between the intellectual leaders and the masses. All students must learn respect for physical labor, from shop work in elementary school to hard farm work during harvest time for university students. The government insists that no one should feel superior because he sits at a desk rather than digs ditches. Conformity to a pattern of life for all is part of a totalitarian society. The state takes great pains to satisfy the demand of the Russian people for reading matter. By controlling the largest publishing industry in the world, the state prints and distributes enormous editions of low-cost books. Many public libraries have been constructed, some of them in factories and collective farms. In the large research libraries, such as this one, all books which the state considers harmful to its interests are kept locked away and can be read only with special permission. Nevertheless, masses of Soviet and foreign technical literature, as well as the 19th century Russian classics, are avidly read. In few other places in the world is reading so popular as a means of professional advancement. Some of the great traditions in the arts are encouraged by the state to provide an outlet for the continuing creativity of the Russian people. The classical ballet has achieved new heights of greatness. Many Russians number among the world's greatest musicians. My wife, who studied at one of the leading musicians in Moscow, was deeply impressed by the training and musicianship of performing artists. Of course, closer study of creative life in the Soviet Union shows that art which does not serve the state. Experimental or critical art is suppressed. In the creative arts, the party has imposed the doctrine of socialist realism, an attempt to combine creativity with loyalty to the state. This portrait is typical of the trend. Intellectuals who do not toe the line have lost their right to be heard, or even have lost their lives. Many people abroad do not know these facts. Memories are short and fade quickly when confronted by the dazzling virtuosity of a Soviet ballerina or violinist. The Soviet leaders believe they can take over the entire world without a war. They believe their system will prove itself superior to ours in the great competition of the coming years. This is the challenge, and we must find an answer to it. These films are intended merely to outline the shape of that challenge. In these few minutes, I could only scratch the surface of this great world problem. It remains for you to push forward the limits of your knowledge, to read, study, and think about this problem. For only in this way can you prepare yourself 
for the crucial test of our way of life. Unlike the Communist Party, we in this country depend for our survival upon the ability and willingness of all our people to respond vigorously, intelligently, and voluntarily to the great challenge of our time.